morning. My name is Maggie Prescott, and I am one of the board members on the King Creek Community Watershed Council. Um, our council started back in 2021, and it was just a group of people who got together to try to figure out what to do with some serious flooding problems that we were having in the Kingsford watershed. So we are a um, 5013C. We have been that for almost two years now. We have 11 total board members. We right now, as of the end of 2023, had 85 members, which consists of both producers and community members. So we have a very active community member um, group within our watershed that collaborate with our producers. Um, we, are, we have three communities in our watershed, um, actually good-sized communities. So um, we are located in three counties, which makes us kind of unique. We're in Vernon County, Monroe County, and La Crosse County. Um, so just last year, we actually hired an independent contractor to be our farmer coordinator to help us do a lot of our work. So today what we have is a panel, so you guys don't have to listen to me the whole day. Um, we're going to highlight different land operations in our watershed and how they work together for a community approach to conservation to reduce soil loss, reduce flooding, and then try to increase our infiltration. So um, I'll introduce the panel quick, but we'll have little kind of introductions before each of their parts. Um, so we have panelists today of uh, Jim Munch, uh, Mike Brickle, Bree Brickle, Matthew Cantor, and James Hunt. So first up is first up is Jim. Kind of got to talk into the We're being recorded, so that's oh, is, is, Can you hear me? I'm yeah. sure. Maggie, will you run the, yep. run the thing here? So at the very first year, we're going to step way back Anything that happens bad in the land or anything that happens good in the land has to do with the land. How it looks, the slopes, the soils, and the people that live on it. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a 35,000 foot view of the Coon Creek watershed. And then with some history, a little bit of history, one slide of history, some of our problems and some unique features of the watershed that may make our problems and solutions different than yours and how we have planned to approach it. So a little bit of history is that the top picture is taken in 1933 uh, during the Depression. It is the result of about 75 years of European settlement and farming on the on the very uh, sloping, fragile soil area that is the Coon Creek watershed. In history, this was a oak savanna. You don't see much oak savanna in that picture on top. The trees were cut down to make structures out of and to clear land for farming that was typical of Europe at, the, at that time. So by the time 1933 came along, it was rough, really rough. Um, in 1933, if you recall, it was that old, not apparently that old, uh, we had repression in the United States. The government poured money into worthy causes. One of the worthy causes that they saw was the whole driftless area sitting right next to the Mississippi River on both sides of the river because of what you see in the top picture. And so the Soil Conservation Service had its very first project in Coon Valley. And we celebrated the 90th anniversary of that just this year. There is a plaque on Highway 14. If you're ever interested, you can stop and read all about it. What resulted was the bottom picture. About 50% of the farms in the watershed embraced conservation, and one of the practices that saved our rear ends was drip crops. And those, that picture of a farm sits, that farm sits there today just like that. So it has sustained a, a number of generations of the same thing. Next slide. But these pictures are current, and they re these pictures represent two of the resource problems we have. All of you are 
struggling to get farmers to embrace no no-till farming practices. Anything but no-till on our land will not pass muster in a in a SNAP plus program in a nutrient management program. And so no-till was was a savior for the farming in our area as small farms, small dairy farms left, that land got put into no-till. But no-till on our slopes and on our in our farm, I'll talk about our farm in a minute here, we farm, it was farmed when I bought it, it was a 20% slope land was still farmed. And so strips held a little bit. No-till on that kind of land, I'm sorry, in RCS, it does not meet feet. Not because of the basic technology, which has come a long way in that time, but it is how it's used. Picture that you see that there is a neighbor, and I can say that because no one knows who my neighbor is, <laughs> who, who for some reason, and a lot of them do this, so well, I know the reason, kind of up and down the hill next to the waterway. So we have horrible gulling. At headlands, we have horrible gulling. And so we, that is one of our resources. Second resource problem is something that got all the way into the New York Times and the national news, and that is flooding. The picture on your left is Coon Valley in 2018, and the picture on the right is Coon Valley in 2018. That bull ended up on my farm, and I didn't charge the guy for the room and board. One of the drivers of this is that in times past, NRCS Soil Conservation Service has put in 13 dams on the upper reaches of the Coon Valley, of the Coon Creek. Three of those dams broke in this rain event. The rain event was a 100-year rain event. We had a 50-year rain event three or four years before that. So as the climate has changed, this has become a huge resource problem for us in the Coon Creek water. And then finally, I don't have a picture of this, we have another problem. Oak savanna has grass underneath the oak tree. Grass holds soil. When you let the, the woods grow and shade out the grass, and if you don't hold the water in the tilled land on the ridges, that water makes horrible ravines and washouts under the canopy of the tree. So that's a third the third resource concern we have. Okay. The other problem with our watershed from a farming standpoint, it was just great for small farms because it's very tortuous land. The, the hillsides on our on this farm or the farms in our area are billy goats. They're almost straight up and down. Um, therefore, the fields, the crop fields are small and do not lend themselves to some of the big equipment that some of the custom operators want to use. That's the reason we have these flat soil at the top. So that's one of our problems. If you look at the whole watershed, it's 90,000 acres. Only 19% of it is cropland. And then we have some residual grasslands. A lot of it, 50% of it is still. So it is a very complex environmental situation, which brings complexity to the farming and complexity to the economic and social, uh, social background that that farming brings. So as the dairy farmers left, and when the generations behind them got rid of the land, they sold it to a very diverse group of landowners, many of which, and this was mentioned before, were not farmers. And so the easy way for them to make some income on that land was to rent it out to people with no-till drills, no-till planters, and large equipment. They'll come in and run it and really don't care too much. One of our challenges is teaching landowners 
to be a little more selective about who they have farm their land. The other, and we have huge slice of different uh, social groups that are operating in our in our watershed. Some are still farmers, some are landlords, not farmers. We have Mennonites, we have Amish, and it is hard for us as a watershed to appeal to all of the groups that can make land use decisions. That is one of our challenges. Um, we cannot even though I am a grazer, and I believe strongly in, in keeping the land covered up and talk about my farm, uh, uh, you can't convince everybody to be a grazer. And you can't certainly teach everybody to be a direct marketer. So we have to come up with a lot of solutions to make, as our tagline is, running water walk. We have to slow the water from coming off of our reaches down these precipitous hillsides into the into, into the creek. So on our farm, um, I moved into the area in 76. Um, we, what you see in front of you is now pasture, but that was all strip crop. We strip crop for a few years right down into 15 degree slope area. See it in this picture. We are on the ridge. Coon Valley is one mile away from us. We're at 1,200, 1200 feet above sea level. Coon Valley is 700 feet above sea level. That drops in less than a mile. So it's very precipitous. Um, we back up. Just let me see this picture. <laughs> 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 I know you're moving now. Anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm not looking at you. That's the reason I'm talking. Anyway. I, we moved on to this land. We did a little of this strip, strip cropping. Uh, I had a job someplace else, so I wasn't you know, going to live and die with what we did on the land. I'm an ag engineer from Purdue. I grew up on a hog farm in Indiana, and I know what erosion was. It just killed me to see what was going on in this area. So I decided I better learn something about cattle. And that was a way to cover the land up. Two objectives, stop erosion and make money. Those were the two objectives. And so for the first 10, 15 years, uh, I explored all the ways that you can lose money raising cattle. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we... We, without having to direct market, which I detest, we hooked up with a big vegetable CSA and did all their cattle for them. That was very satisfying. And then that fell apart, and we joined the Wisconsin National Beef. That has been very pleasant from an economic standpoint. And anybody in the cattle business, the beef cattle business, last year was a smiling year. Very, very high. That was a, an anomaly. And the grass making co op is basically fulfilled that second requirement. Now you can sustain it. As far as the first requirement is concerned, that is to save soil, we ran our soils through a program called Grayscape, uh, sponsored by Graduate Teacher Support University, for which I do see. And we looked at what the soil loss, P loss, would be if we had other forms of cultivation on our land. So on the very right-hand side is soil loss, and then at the bottom, P loss, phosphorus loss, with managed grazing. It is slower, slower soil loss than nature can build soil. So it's a win. As you go up to corn, beans, and other forms of tillage, you soon pass T, probable soil loss. And you're now sending dump trucks of soil off your land and the attendant phosphorus that attaches to the soil. And so 
this is living proof that what you do on the land can make a huge difference to, let's say, oh, I don't know, five or six generations after all of us are gone. Other thing that comes along with it, now you can hear it, <laughs> is stormwater runoff. Remember, the number one uh, resource concern we have in, in the area is soil loss, phosphorus loss attending to that. Number two is floods and flooding. So if you look at this, even with a five-inch rain, you're, with managed grazing, you're at half the runoff that you would be with a full plain system. So we've solved that problem as well. Underlying problem in our area, as I mentioned before, is that there was a water retention to these dams. Lost three dams, and uh, somebody in a government position has determined we will not rebuild them. And in fact, we cannot maintain the ones that still exist. So they're going to decommission. So one of the big problems that we're facing in the area is how do we keep water up and not down through Coon Valley? <laughs> and, and, and so, if we could convince everybody to be grazers, and we can't, but if we could, that would be one solution. So one of our jobs is to come up with other solutions. Be they cover crops, journey strips, uh, go back to terraces, or some other solution. That's our goal for the future, and now I will relinquish this wonderful. Take it. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> Jim likes to talk. And that's what like that. we had today, all the way here. Um, our next presenter is Mike Burkle. Mike is from Westby, Wisconsin, and he actually raises elderberries on his land. And he can tell us a little about that. Thank you. I uh, basically have a small commercial elderberry operation, it's all organic. And I uh, started basically uh, in working with elderberries in the early 1980s when a friend basically asked me to wild harvest some elderberries for him so that he could make his favorite elderberry wine. I did that for many years, and the fruits of it. And then in the um, late 1990s, my lovely wife, Rita, pointed out an article in the local hospital news uh, letter. Uh, about a study that showed that elderberries had strong antiviral properties. After I read the, the study, it turned out to be a very small study. And it, about less than 50 people, all of them had one of the flu viruses that was going around at the time, ours or not. And um, however, it was a double blind controlled test, and the results of that were that people who had the, the test group that got the elderberry uh, juice, basically their symptoms were milder, and their um, the duration of the flu was shorter. That was enough to inspire me to plant the first quarter acre of elderberries, and um, right now I have, you can see on, on the picture up there, is uh, about an acre of elderberries. And uh, I run it as a pick your own operation. People come out, they get a tote, they, they put as many elderberry heads in there as they want, they bring them back, and I run them through a little distiller that I invented that basically separates the hundreds and hundreds of small berries from the seed head uh, without damaging the berries and without a lot of stem in the berries as well as you throw back. Um, this is a picture this is a picture of the December. We're now manufacturing that in Morocco very locally. We have both a national and an international market for that. One international <laughs> <laughs> um, the, mach the machine itself is, is more efficient than I ever dreamed of when I started making it. We had one grower that basically reported that he was 
up to 500 pounds of elderberries in an hour, and he had gotten 80,000 pounds of elderberries in the first year. Oh, uh, I forgot, to, I missed the uh, punchline on the uh, pick your own. My growers leave the farm with clean, uh, fresh berries and lots of smiles because stemming the elderberries is the hard part of growing elderberries. We're now working on a, on a different model for people who are just getting started in the elderberry business or people who want to stay small. It'll be basically the same type of machine, but basically it'll be one that you can start off with a very simple machine and then add the bells and whistles on it as it becomes profitable. Thank you. All right, our next presenter is James Hunt. He is from Coon Valley. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about no to leaves and cover crops. Um, so they've been doing it for about eight years. Hi, can we hear me good? So I am representing my dad, so we'll say something wrong. Don't blame me. Not yet. Uh, we started no tilling in 2001 and cover crops in 2016. Made a lot of mistakes. It doesn't always work right the first time. Don't be discouraged. You're going to lose money, you're going to lose dirt. But eventually it works. So we first tried 2000, 2016, 35 acres of after combine or soybeans, spread winter rye over it, and kind of worked. It wasn't much growth before it froze. Came back up next year, it's like four inches by the time we did burn down. Didn't do much. And in 2020, we said, okay, we're going to try this. We spread our fertilizer onto the corn, we put our no till rye, uh, sorry, our rye in there with it. And we just drove right through the soybeans like a month and a half before they were in combine. We lose like two rills. Who cares? <laughs> Your field's going to be there the next year. We found a lot more advantageous to run some soybeans over, get the rye in there so it's like four inches when you combine. It looks like this. Those are combine hands. Come back one. You see the picture on the right? That is our soybeans coming up the next spring. After our burn down in the spring, we have roughly a foot to two feet of actual plant matter there, which is going to be the same underneath, and it holds the ground really well. This is what it looks like in the middle of winter. These are taken this year because there's no snow. That's our field now. There's a lot of plant matter there. As soon as it gets warm, it stays warm. Keep growing. You can see in the background on the right how far it does. Our hills are really steep. Some of the stuff we've combined can't fill the combine up all the way, it'll tip over. So it's really steep. This works. Nice. All right, and our next uh, presenter is Matthew Cantor. He's from Cashin, Wisconsin, and he has a rotational free dairy operation he does. Matthew, talk about it. All right, well, good morning. So, together with my wife and our five children, uh, we own and operate a 50 cow organic and grass fed dairy farm at the top of the Coon Creek watershed. So we're at about 1,350 feet above sea level, and uh, everything goes downhill. So started we started our farm in 2017. Uh, I am a first generation dairy farmer. Everyone else was getting out. I thought, hey, it's a good time to get in. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but the uh, the farm that we we purchased was uh, continuously row cropped. Uh, for years and years, and as a result, we had very low organic matter and very low pH. But I then learned when I tried to plant alfalfa, nothing came up. So I thought, well, perhaps this isn't for me. So uh, as a result, we ended up uh, planting those fields in you know, pasture and uh, clover swards. Uh, so after the catastrophic uh, flooding that Jim had mentioned back in 2018, uh, we had a localized 13-inch rain event. And as a result of that, even up on top, springs formed on the side hills and led to the land degradation in the form of gullies, as affected here in my neighbor Creek. Um, so as a result of all of those factors, we ended up investing more of our time in pasture, more of our time in getting the cows outside grazing. Uh, so as a result now, our pastures are a two to one ratio of acres to cows. And erosion is very much a thing of the past. And even during these major soaking rain events, we no longer see cooling at all. The water just infiltrates. 
Uh, so over the past four years of intensive grazing, uh, we've adapted our herd to move at least twice a day. And so we have large paddocks, and the benefit of large paddocks using reels and poly wire is that we can adjust it to, you know, in terms of the conditions. And we also have a mobile water station for our cows so that they can have water at all times. Uh, the standard anymore is that we have we leave an eight inch residue. It seems like a, a waste of feed to a lot of people, but as a result, it keeps the ground cool and it actually encourages a more vibrant regrowth. So this past year, during a Adjectives, extreme severe drought, um, we still actually produced milk. We still actually had um, five grazings to our farm. Now, typically, our rest period is 32 days, but considering we didn't have rain for quite a few months, we actually were able, because of our pasture base, uh, to extend it out to a 51 day rotation. Uh, I will say that perhaps one of the most, more tangible benefits of the style of grazing dairy farming is that it can and ultimately should be a low input system. So my time in the tractor is limited to interseeding, clipping, and hauling manure. I leave haymaking to custom operators that can afford the big equipment that my farm can never fill. Uh, our concern is not uh, breaking milk production records, but maximizing fresh forage intake, thereby making the lowest cost milk possible. Uh, this paradigm of low inputs uh, is further strengthened by being part of a niche organic market. So in response to the requirements of organic certification, grazing standards, and even that lower volume, our average payment for our milk is two to three times higher than conventional milk. I'm not saying this style of farming is for everyone. I would say, however, if you're not afraid of work, if you're not afraid of being outside, and you enjoy working with your family on the farm, Organic grass-fed dairy farming is something anyone can do. Among the FSA, NRCS, DATCAP, my own cooperative Organic Valley, there are many opportunities to start and establish a grazing dairy farm. It's not a hereditary venture. I'm sure in some ways it makes it easy, in some ways it makes it harder. Uh, I would only caution that you not get muddled down uh, with big equipment or fancy feeds or gimmicks. Let cows be cows. Let them do the work that they don't mind doing. Have grass, will travel, is the mantra of any cow. <laughs> and the, the miracle of that cow's ruminate, the ability to take forage and turn it into delicious grass milk, is so easy, and it's translated to a healthy family, farm, and herd. All right, and then Bree Brickle is also from Cashel Estates. She's going to talk about her I'm Bree. I am a maple syrup farmer at uh, Embark Maple. Um, I am, some of the pictures that Matthew just had up were our field. So our, our farm is um, 184 acres, about 160, 160 of that is mature maple forest. Um, as you heard from everybody in, in here, we have, we have quite some topography where we're at. So you can kind of get, it's hard to, hard to catch in a picture, but you can kind of see some of the, the slope that we're working in. Um, and um, another thing that I wanted to say was really just really neat about our group here is, is the connections that we have. Um, this is my dad. Um, so I grew up on one side of our watershed, went all the way down the valley and, you know, a couple sections <laughs> over where, where our, um, our maple forest is. So, um, you know, between their farm and then, you know, Matthew's cows get to come visit us when it's their rotation, so that's pretty fun too. Um, but just this really cool community of people who are doing a lot of different things and a lot of different topography, um, but all kind of connecting and working together through this through through the watershed. Um, but as as Jen was saying, our our sugar house is up on the ridge. That's um, about 350 feet of vertical to where our collection tanks are down in the valley, um, and we're we're kind of representing that that 49 percent of of our watershed that's forested um, by maple serving, and we're really fortunate um, to be able to have, like we're in a mature maple forest. People ask, did you plant the trees? And I'm like, well, they're about 90 years old before we start having them. So no, I did not, I didn't plant them. I um, did. <laughs> I knew. Um, so like, by working with, like, by working with the, the topography 
opportunity that we have um, working with this healthy, mature forest, um, not, not trying to impose something different on the landscape, but working with what we have there. Our forest has a beautiful understory. We have a, um, a rich ecosystem under there, and we have, we have a lot of um, native perennials that just naturally grow in the, the, the mature maple forest. So we have ramps, and we have wild ginger, and we have all of these plants that, that thrive in the dense, um, dense canopy of a maple forest um, on these steep hillsides. And when we had these flooding events in 2018, you know, we kind of, I think all of us just kind of stumbled out into our land in, in shock. Just like, what just happened? And we're walking through our woods and we're seeing, you know, we're seeing land, like holes where land had been. And then you look over um, and you see the roots of the ramps and the, the wild ginger and all of these perennials that, you know, this healthy forest is supporting like literally holding the hills together. Um, and that's really cool. You know, if we're able to, through maple farming, we're able to support and work with that, um, that ecosystem. So we kind of do a couple layers of value adding. So we, you know, do the, um, from sap to the syrup cooking out at the sugar house. Um, and then we make a couple, um, a couple different product lines. So we do a bourbon barrel aged maple syrup and a maple energy, so that's a, an active outdoor uh, maple product. Um, and those we, we direct market. Um, and get you know getting into stores and getting directly to people. Um, we're on Amazon now, that's kind of weird. But okay, <laughs> that's kind of weird. Um, and then we also do farm events. And so that's a, a space where we can both tell and show the story of our watershed. We have uh, people out to the farm during syrup season, we do um, a hike through the woods with, with snack stops every kilometer or so, so you can, you know, taste your way through the woods, but, but also experiencing some of the erosion that we've had, experiencing some of the resilience that we've had. Um, and then we do a, a bike tour of our whole watershed. So getting people, getting people in the community and um, engaged and involved and, and really kind of celebrating this special place we have with these cool people that we get to spend time with. Everybody, um, we just wanted to share a few of our accomplishments that we had for 2023. Um, real quick, we held a bunch of meetings for our community of trying to figure out how we're going to learn without, live without the dam. Um, and with all the flooding and what we're going to do, we also worked with UW to do oral narrative project. Um, we have a lot of um, different generations of farmers in our area, and a lot of them were around in 1933, which you described. So we got a lot of oral narrative stories put together, and we're working with UW on that. Um, like Jen said, we celebrated the 90th anniversary of the um, of the Coon Creek water the Coon Creek watershed project. Coon, oh Coon Creek watershed project. I think is what it. Um, and we're building up to a big 100th anniversary celebration in 10 years. We have um, general meetings every month. We also have Coon Creek Conservation Day, and I wanted to hit on that because our next um, Coon Creek Con Con Conservation Day is May 4th, um, and it's in Coon Valley, and basically what it is is we have local artisan market, local food, conservation activities. Um, last year we gave free cookies to the kids. Um, we have the rainfall simulator there. We have a bunch of resources prepared for people that they can, they can come and do, and this year we are getting uh, Molly B., but we are getting Molly B to do a concert in Coon Valley that night. Um, so we're kind of, that's where we bring the community into our watershed, is we have the producers, but we also try to get our community involved and figure out what can they do at a community level to help with what we're trying to do. Um, and the last thing is we did have eight farmers participate in the Public Crop Program. I know eight doesn't seem like a lot, but when Jim shared his math of only 19% of our, our watershed land Cropland, um, we do have less of that than forest and grazing land. Any questions? I know we're right at lunch, so I know there might not be a lot of questions. Okay, good luck. <laughs>